Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Atari, many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. This is part of the e-commerce mastery series where top sellers teach you what really works to boost your e-commerce business. Our sponsor today is Rise25.com, where entrepreneurs of six, seven, eight-figure businesses come together live and in person every few months to solve their biggest business challenges and leave with lifelong friendships, check out rise25.com. It's run by myself and co-founder John Corcoran. It's application only. Today I'm excited. I was excited when I have Chicago entrepreneurs. Today we have Peter Rahal, co-founder of RX Bar. They manufacture whole food protein bars with a no BS value proposition since the base of the bar only includes whole food ingredients like egg whites, almonds, cashews, and dates. They sell more than 175,000 bars per month and can be found in Trader Joe's across the country, as well as Wegmans Grocery, Whole Foods, and I think over 4,000 other places. Peter, thanks for joining me. Jeremy, thank you for the introduction. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and so I want to, we're going to dig into the history of RX Bar, but you know, I was asking a fun fact, and you started to go into, it sounded like an amazing story, so I didn't want to hear it, but a fun fact when you started no office. Yeah. Tell me about that. No office. So like one of our, we've always like believed like we want to have outstanding customer service and we want to be like really easy to work with and you need a phone number, right? And so we didn't have an office We were Jared and I were in our apartments and then later we moved to like a, a small little manufacturing facility on the West side. And I was like, all right, well, I'll just put my cell phone on it. So we, on all for like two years, I had my cell phone on every impression or website. <laughs> and it was just funny, like the whole business was ran through my cell phone for two years. Um, so that's an interesting fact. Whereas, you know, we didn't have to do that, but it was important to be available. So can you tell if someone was coming in from the business or was a friend? How would you answer the phone? No, no clue. Just answer every call. So you answer it just, how, do you, how did you answer the phone in those two years? Hello, this is Peter. Welcome to RX Bar. Just, <laughs> it's funny. But. And so friends knew when they called, you may just be answering because it's the business. Yeah, yeah and I, I believe like there's no bad solicitation, right? Like everyone's a customer, so I, I embraced it. So why was it so important for you to have the phone number? Because I know big businesses, which it still surprises me that they don't have any phone number. You can't talk to a human being. Yeah, for me, you know, it's kind of like our value prop, right? No BS, like... We want to make doing business with us as easy as possible, and right. our the phone number had to be there even early on. Like yeah. to this day, like we take calls at all hours, and even before when we got a phone, and then those phone numbers when we left the office were forwarded to our cell phones. Um, I think it's like when you're building something great, like every transaction interaction matters, um, and so you just got to be available. It's like part of the territory, right, of entrepreneurship. Like yeah. I, if someone, if a customer has a question, I want them to ask, be able to ask me. Yeah, so, I love that. So talk about the first batch you made in the kitchen because you created these. You started just making them on your own, right? Yeah. So pretty humble beginnings. Uh, Jared Smith, co-founder of, um, we just started like really simply. Um, we we always bought commercial ingredients, which was good. And my background's in the raw material business. So we just started like in the kitchen, just like trying, failing, trying, failing. And, you know, that was back in November 2012. What um, were you trying when you say failing? What ingredients were you using that you're like, this is not going to work at all? Um, well, we always knew the direction we wanted to go from like the product positioning, which is what it is today. So like a, basically a fruit nut protein bar. Mm -hmm. um, and it was basically just getting the formula right, right? Like right. just trial and error, trial and error. Um, <clears throat> and making it taste good, right? So that's like the hardest part. Right. Um, right. It could be healthy and have the yeah. ingredients, but then no one wants to eat it. Yeah. And then to this day, like taste is the main driver for anyone's decision. Um, Nutrition is important, but like if it doesn't deliver taste, no one's going to buy it. Mm -hmm. So we, we understood that early on. So, um, yeah, just trial and error. So I mean, what were some of those ingredients that you knew could not, even though maybe they're healthy and they were good to be at the bar that you just could not include in there? Yes, we, 
so we have a pretty like from the beginning had a very firm like standard of ingredients so you know we only could use whole foods so we weren't like putting different syrups in or like sweeteners um so it's really just getting that right um there's been some flavor failures i would say they're more common like for example we wanted to do a pumpkin spice earlier and pumpkin's kind of like hard actually um and we tried bacon like just you got to try try it but the bacon was terrible. The pumpkin early on was terrible. We honed it in. Um, you have a pumpkin one now, right? Yeah, and we finally took two years, but the first version was, t- like, not good. Um, but, yeah, it's the one we have today on the market is awesome. So take me through – I know you have some uh, products there. Take me through a little history of our bar. Yeah. So, again, we had humble beginnings, started in my parents' basements, cr- like, commercially – um, we had the original, we went to market with blueberry and coconut cacao. It was a pure chocolate and then originally another chocolate one. And, um, cause of production capacity issues, we cut the chocolate one and we just went with two. And so we had those for about three months. Um, and really we we're trying to, the big challenge for us was scaling manufacturing. So like we went batch to sale, right? Batch to sale, growing it. Um, so how many would you produce in the original batches? Uh, sorry, sorry, I got a reminder came up. Um, so our original bat, we first bought a 20 quart mixer, which was like, I think it's like 20 pounds of dough. And then we went to a hundred, 140 quart, which was, I think our batch sizes were 70 pounds and we would do like 10 batches a day. How many bars would that make? About That would make like 6,000. Wow. Six to six to sixty five hundred, yeah. So that's and that was great because then you could just learn the process and be really intimate with the product every day, touching it, seeing and how it changes, um, which is really important, especially for entrepreneurs. Like you, I feel like you have to be really like use the word like intimate with the product. Like you have to know ins and outs from the whole process. So for yeah. us, that was like critical to scale the manufacturing. What was the setup like? Was it you? And your co-founder Jared, yeah. and you were were you the only people producing it, or were there other people helping out? So it was Jared and I on the front end, and then we would have uh, 12, 12 people supporting us on the team, helping us make it as well. So and so, what's your process, Peter? For would you sell them ahead of time? Would you have a certain amount sold, or would you just go, we're going to sell these things? Let's just produce as many as humanly possible, and go out and sell them. Well, for us, we went batch to sale. Um, we didn't carry much. We didn't have ca- we had no cash, right? We didn't start the business, but we didn't raise money or anything. So it was Jared and I's money, and so we only made product to sell it. Um, we didn't really carry much inventory, so that's how we for the two first two years. That's how we operated. Um, yeah, and just went you know gym to gym selling it, grocery store, whatever we could. So you were the ultimate we, hustler. You yes. Were- Yes. Like we literally would spend the morning making it every day, the PM packing it, and then in the free time servicing and selling. Like that was that was it for over a year. So we did the hustle. What would the packaging look like then? You have a yeah. few to show. Like yeah. show a few. So here's the original. Um, it's pretty and good. So this is important because like we didn't – I'll put you right here. We didn't have any resources to buy like – in a proper like horizontal flow wrapper um so we just bought pre-made packaging right it was expensive but we didn't have the resources to buy um you know proper uh bar equipment so we just like and then like any good entrepreneur you just had a problem didn't have resources so we found a really reasonable solution and it's funny in the beginning this was like this was a point of differentiation <laughs> um so you'd have to you have to stick those on separately. Each of those, like yeah, yeah. So two labels. Yeah. So, yeah, and that was very labor intensive. We had one girl just sitting there all day doing that. So I totally empathize with her. Um, <laughs> so it'd come off the line. Someone would have to stick it in the package, or how would it, how would it get like sealed? Yeah. Yeah. You, well, these are so these are pre-made pouches, and you would just literally hand pack it and then seal it and that was it <laughs> and then someone would have to stick both the labels on each of the sides yeah well we would do that before because before, it's hard right yeah because when there's a product in it 
it's not easy to apply, but when it's flat and empty, it's easier. Mm-hmm. To apply, so, what was the next evolution? So you have this huge mixer. You're making six thousand bars. It's, they're coming off. You're, you're labeling them, hand labeling them, and sealing it. What was the next um, like evolution of the process that you improved in the manufacturing and? <clears throat> So, like, the real challenge is always scaling um, sales and production. That's, like, a really challenging thing. And for us, it was we had to commercialize and, like, make the product in a bigger way. Um, So that was, like, the next chapter for us was, like, how do we commercialize this? How do we make this so we can focus on building the brand and and focus on um, other aspects besides, like, the manufacturing component? Working 24 hours a day. Yeah. 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 So what, show me one of the other ones, the next versions, because I know you have another one sitting there of after the original, yeah. So then here's like our, the next version, which is a properly like made bar, (laughs) stable. So. Yeah. And so what's, uh, so, you know, right now your design and your label is so, so clean and clear yeah. and minimalist. I love it. And what you do differently is you obviously list the ingredients on the front. You almost will just live it, you know, you can see the fine print in the back. Yours are on the front. So do you have a current version yeah. of that design? Yes, yeah, so here's current. Yeah. So <laughs> when did, at what point did you come to this this and you changed the the design? So when we were when we got out of the weeds, right? Like got out of the, the, the exhausting day-to-day uh, manufacturing and just be able to hire some help, we <clears throat> got time to like think about it. And here's a really, there's a really good example here is like, so Jared and I designed this product, this, this art and everything on like PowerPoint. Right. Um, Jared and I are not designers. <laughs> and, and, but we had, like, we had no money again. And so we had to like, you do had, what you have to do. Yeah. And for us, it's just like, all right, <clears throat> you heard the expression, like, you have an ugly baby. <laughs> sure. Like, we realized, like, hey, our baby that we're, we've been building is ugly, and it was time to, like, give it a good facelift. Did um, someone I, tell you that, or did you realize that? We realized it. You um, we had some good people, help, resources help us, but we, we knew, right? Um, and the common thing, like, on the back of this bar was this equation of, like, three – Three egg whites, X dates, almonds, um, so like what you see today. Right. And it was just early on we could tell like, hey, that's like that's like a powerful value prop and like right. that really resonated with our customers and so we're like, well, let's you know, we can't win on appetite appeal, right? Like egg whites aren't appetizing, so it's like, well, let's lead with the value prop on the product. Um and like we had people who when we were in the beginning directions of that artwork, like we're like, don't do that, it's a mistake. You need a big chocolate cake or like a big piece of coconut or something and like we're like we can't do that everyone does everyone else does that and right. that's not why people buy it like it's a pro it's a natural protein yeah. bar actually so you put the want. differentiator front and center yeah exactly so how did you find someone to like carry that vision because you have that vision in your head but what comes out on the design could be very different yeah and so we we made a really good brief we worked with a, a, a local um a local agency that was awesome um, and they did an amazing job bringing it to life um, yeah great people right that's what's that's the key so here talk about the door to door you go CrossFit gym to CrossFit gym yeah. so what worked because that, that takes some guts right you're just going in you have like a bag of bars selling from gym to gym what, yeah I mean sorry to interrupt like they're good just you start, you open for business and you need sales, right? Like it isn't going to be, they're not going to come to you. Right. So you have to just make it happen and, and it might be uncomfortable, but like you just have to do it. And, um, for us, we, you know, there was no other option, right? Like we have to sell the product. So we went door to door and we knew our customers, we knew who wanted it. So we would just, you know, CrossFit gyms were our, our, our DNA and where we started. So. Yeah. What's your sales pitch? You go into a CrossFit gym. What do you tell them? <laughs> it's a good question. Um, well, when we started, there wasn't any retail in CrossFit. Like most of the gyms didn't have it. So there was almost like 
you had to sell a product, but you also had to sell the idea of, hey, you should right. offer, make it even harder. It's your customer, but you should offer some goods. Like they're, you're, you're doing a great job working them out, yeah, adding a lot of value, but they, they're hungry afterwards. Like for sure, where we would fit in. So there was like two, two problems we had to solve. In the beginning, but now it's different. Now, now it, did that it, help you? The fact that they didn't have anything else, or hurt you? It so there was a, a little barrier in the beginning, but um, in general, retrospectively, it was a good thing, I think. Um, but you know, the selling was arguably harder, you know, in 2013 than it is today. But overall, it's, it's a, it was a good thing. Yeah, and also the CrossFit people are very paleo friendly, and yours is is paleo, right? Yep, it's com- like compliant with paleo. And the whole, th- how hard is it to get like a, I don't know if it's called certified whole thirty or is it, or how hard is that? Yeah, it's, there's no like certification. It's um, the whole thirty program. It, it's basically there's some parallels with paleo, but yeah. it, it's the um, Muscle and Dallas Hartwigs program. So if like if your product confines to like no added sugar, no dairy, no, right. no gluten. Um, it can conform to to the that diet or that yeah because uh, they're they have a huge you know rabid fans and if you look at the post for RX bar there's like mm-hmm. I don't know if it's hundreds of comments but it's like people are really into that yeah yeah well I mean because the reason why is like similar to CrossFit like whole thirty works like people will get results and so when you have results like that you talk about it you want to share um, and it, when you change someone's life like it. You want to tell your loved ones. You want to tell your friends. You want so that's why it's become so popular and similar to CrossFit. Like people who try, you know, bodybuilding or, or running and triathlons or whatever, and then like do something as intense and functional as CrossFit, they, and they actually get really good results and meet some people. Like right. they become passionate and, and share it. So the, that's a, a kind of a common thread I'd say between those two. Yeah, results. Peter, so at the time when you started RX Bar, what were you doing at the time? I was working for a transportation startup, so like a 3PL. Okay. So that was that Mondi Foods, or is that something completely separate? Mondi Foods? No. I, so Mondi Foods was in Belgium. That was my first, like, I guess, job out of college. Because yeah. I saw that. In, you were, in Bel- were you living in Belgium at the time? Yeah. So yeah. what were you doing? So I, they were a red fruit processor. So Red fruit? Were, yeah. So like strawberries, raspberries, um, that segment of raw material. So yeah. we would take it and make it either juice concentrate, single strength puree, concentrated puree, IQF fruit. And then I was on um, like sales and marketing side, like thinking about like application of the product, like different segments to get into. So mm-hmm. and that was a great experience for me. What did you learn working there? <clears throat> two things, like two real things. Um, again, it was my first like formal job. I mean, I had obviously other jobs before, but <clears throat> after graduating school, uh, one is like culture, like how to, it was great to have a different lens of how other countries and people work. Yeah. Um, but then the other component was like just really understanding like farm, like the whole process, the back end, like growers and where they, like how that part of the supply chain works. Yeah. And then that was like really probably just understanding closely that side of the business was um, the most valuable. What did you see there in that process that most people don't see? Like quality matter, like your inputs. So the the raw material actually matters. So like, mm-hmm. and it's kind of similar to nutrition. Like what you eat matters. Um, and you can't go like you can't go cheap. Yeah, it gives you a unique perspective, right? Because if you didn't see that, because mm-hmm. you probably think about that with obviously what goes into the RX bar. Yeah. Like your ingredients, like there's I mean, as soon as you start thinking of them as commodities, you're in trouble. They're not. Like there's definitely quality matters, and I've, that's probably one of the most important things I've learned there. How do they do business differently? You mentioned obviously it's in a different country than yeah. than us here. Yeah. Well, Belgium's interesting because it's you know it's French speaking, it's Flemish, it's uh, there's German. And they're in a unique position where they're next to France, Germany, Holland, and in the UK. Um, and it was just really interesting, like the balance of cultures. And um, it was just cool that you see them all collide there, right? Like, it was fun to be a part of. And then the way they do, like, in America, we like hustle. Like, 
we work really hard here. Um, and they're like, you know, France is like a 39 hour work week and, um, they value different, like they value life in a different way. Like, you know, they want to have dinner and like, it's just a different culture. Whereas America, it's about like growing, building, always being better. Like this, that American spirit, There's more um, balance there. Yes. Well, uh, yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm speaking from an entrepreneur's perspective too, for sure. A very entrepreneurial family. Yeah. Uh, you but come was, from a line of entrepreneurs. So what yeah. what were some of your family members? What businesses did they start? So it's on both sides of my family. My mother's side, the Bowdens, um, my great uncle uh, started uh, Tampico. I'm sure you, I don't know if you're familiar yeah, for with sure. it. It's yeah, for sure. It's a juice drink. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and they sold that business, I think, in the uh, early 2000s. And then my grandfather, my mother's father, started um, Bodine's, but he, before that, he was really early on with uh, Home Juice, which is much my like Leonard Haddad, who started that in Chicago. And then my father's side, um, my uncle's a race car driver, Bobby Ray Hall. Um, he's gotten into like different car agencies, so BMW, Honda, in Pittsburgh. And then my f- great uncle started Ray Hall Foods, or um, well, they formally changed. They were uh, Hard Dog Ray Hall. Um, so yeah, and like I grew up just in the food business one, but just like working and learning. What did and you do early on? What were some of the jobs they made you do? I would always just like sell, like I was thinking about it, I was talking to my partner earlier, like I would just like sell stuff in school. Like I would make skateboards and sell them and then um, just commerce, right? Like just the transaction, That's I would just participate in that. And um, and then, yeah, there's some things I can't say on the <laughs> Use your imagination. I can make some guesses. Um, so what did you want to be when you grew up in high school and college? God, that's a good question. Um, you know, I haven't, I wasn't like, oh, I want to be an entrepreneur, but I always, I was very entrepreneurial. I just like wanted to control my own fate. I don't was think there I there a really, thought of I'm going to go into a family business or, or is it always I'm going to start my own business? Yeah, I thought I was going to go in, because we have a family business, I thought I was going to go in there. Um, the timing of it didn't really work out, so I just like made my own, with Jared, we made our own business. Um, yeah, and it, I don't know. Yes. Yeah, I just, it's hard to say. I mean, because there's a long line there, and I want you to talk about team for a second. So it's you and Jared, right? So who are the next team members, key hires you have to make? Um, so like... Sales cures all, right? So we, of course, from an entrepreneur. That was like our focus. Yeah. yeah, it was that was our focus. Um, and then, well, the big hit for Jared and I was like for the first year and a half, it was just us. Um, we had some other help, but but like from growing the business, it was just us. And once we were able to attract talent and like build a team, it was very clear that like that's what's going to take the business to the next level and Mm -hmm. we've done a really good job adding to our teams like today we have 28 people um, directly working for us or with us Um, and like there's a direct consequence of like talent and growth Um, that's one thing I've observed and um, yeah and those people need a vision those people need need a good culture to be a part of and yeah I want you to talk about culture right because I you spoke to culture that I, I watched on another um, site, and I want you to talk about your view of culture when you started the company and then now, because there was a big difference there, right? Yeah, hundred percent. So for me, I, I always have to define what something means to fully understand it. Um, and early on, like I was like, "Oh, culture is a buzzword." Like you'd read about it in Inc. or whatever. I'm like, "Oh, it's fucking. We don't have time for culture." <laughs> Right, I'm going like, to gym the gym here. <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. What's the culture? I'm the culture. Right. Um, and but like, I didn't realize like Jerry and I had our own culture. Like, but when it's two people, like if I said something to a customer that Jared was like, no, he'd just slap my hand and be like, don't do that. And be like, all right, you're right, you're right. But when you grow from like to ten people, then fifteen people, like those values, yeah. you can't slap people's hand when they don't do something right. Um, and so then I realized like, oh shit, we need to like formalize this. Like yeah. we're growing and, and I can't slap everyone's hands or and vice versa. And so like for me, I was like, all right, what is culture? 
and then, you know, I, I always look to how a nation operates, right? Like you look at France as a country, like they have a language, they have a food, they have a way they greet each other. Like, like that's their culture. And like, so culture is like how you work, but it's mm -hmm. also like how you live and every company or organization group of people need to have that. Um, and also like, people on our team, like they need to know what the values are of our company and our organization. Mm -hmm. And it's just like really important um, because it makes people feel safe. It gives people like, Oh, like guidelines almost of how to, how to work, how to live and how, how we work around here. Yeah. So how do me, you formalize it? Um, I went to our story. Um, I went to our story. I, I didn't want to make arbitrary like values. So I just like went back and, looked at our story and like basically pulled some common patterns of our, our beliefs and like our values. And like yeah. one of, for example, like the phone number thing, yeah. um, like one of our values is a servant mindset. It's and, like, put your like, personal her. cell phone. On. Yeah. <laughs> no. Right. Yeah. But, like servant leadership service. So servant mindset is one of our values. Yeah. And, um, that's not like I live that today. Like, you know, I, I, yeah. I believe in servant leadership and I, I we walk it. So, yeah. Um, we just so, went to our story to pull our values. And that yeah. Was cool. So what's another one? Yeah, that's interesting. It's not like you just came up with let's choose our values. You went back to the original story of how you live certain values, and then you pulled the value out of that story. So the cell phone, what were some other uh, stories and what you pulled from them? Yeah, so another one of another really key value is, for us is like the pursuit of excellence. Um, and I just think about like the journey our product has gone through. Um, yeah. And that's like been my personal pursuit of just trying to, like my job is to make the best product possible. And I just look back at our history from, we used to be a 70 gram bar. Um, we've gone down to 65 and 52 and lowered the price. So it's more affordable. And then also like the versions, like the number of versions we've gone through, like, and then the different quality, we've improved the quality of the raw material. So it's like a constant evolution and it's the pursuit of excellence and whatever function you're in, like that's part of our culture. Like, we just had hired a director of HR and like her objective is like to professionalize and we want to have the best HR department. Like that's how we think about things and yeah. there's no wrong, just failure is okay if that's an outcome, but as long as you're pursuing excellence, that's something that's important to us. Yeah. Our what, what have you seen with the most pronounced version change um, for a bar? That's a good question. Um, yeah, that's a good point. So uh, we originally made the product with dates and figs as like the binding source. Mm -hmm. um, we had different quality issues and just like, I look back like, why is it? In, I guess it's a tough business, man. I mean, there's so yeah. when you're working with these whole food ingredients. Yeah. Like, and then for us, from a stability standpoint, like we need super consistent materials coming in. It yeah. can't vary. And we just had some quality issues. And then we were like, wait, what? and I just like look back, like, why is it in there? You know, like less is more. That's the mindset I always have. Like, and so we, we substituted that and put cashews in mm. and we did that across the whole family. Like it was just, it made a better product. And when you think about it, like figs are much cheaper than cashews. Yeah. So it wasn't a cost decision. It was a quality decision. Right. Uh, and that's something we, that was a big, big, uh, clean change, hard change we did that actually was, that was probably the most pronounced impact. Um, yeah, and we didn't do a survey. We just knew it was the best for the product and our customers. And yeah. we just, yeah. So what are the most popular flavors? So chocolate, sea salt, uh, blueberry, coconut, chocolate, um, peanut butter, mint chocolate, and uh, their new one, maple sea salt, I think is. Uh, Why did you start with blueberry? I, I'm that's like I wouldn't have expected that. The 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 first one of the first ones was the coconut chocolate one, right? Coconut yeah, chocolate and blueberry. <laughs> Why blueberry? All right, so there's like this is my this is how we think about it. It's like there's two types of people: people that like chocolate, and then people like fruit. Okay. And everyone likes chocolate, but yeah, I, but some people like, you know, when you, when you go like shopping for ice cream, some people like strawberry and some people right. like that. Like I personally yeah, no. always like chocolate or peanut butter. Right. Right. Um, and so we just wanted the portfolio to have like a, attract those different people. Gotcha. Um, so that was the rationale. Yeah. So the name, how did you get RX bar? Was that available? 
Yeah. A five-letter yeah. domain was available. Yeah. And so we, how did I, you decide on choosing the name, <laughs> RX Bar? Yeah, so our, it's a great our, name. our DNA is in CrossFit, um, mm -hmm. and it's a shorthand for health, right? Yeah. Um, so for us, it was just like a natural, natural connection. So you guys just came up with it, and the domain was actually available. You didn't have to yes. buy it off anyone. Well, no, we had to pay, we had to pay for it. Thousand oh, bucks. Okay, yeah. that's still yeah, it's a great great uh, yeah. value for that. And it's funny, like retrospect, like a thousand bucks was a lot of money, right? And we were like, I remember Jerry and I were just like arguing over like, all right, we're not arguing, just discussing if it's like RX hyphen bar and like <laughs> how, like going cheap and getting that for nineteen bucks. <laughs> no, we're not going cheap on like the domain. That's important. So. Yeah, for sure. Um, pricing. Talk about pricing for a second, because this is, I find it with, with a bar like this, high quality ingredients, you know, people want it obviously to be healthy and it tastes good, but they also don't want to pay a huge amount. So what's the thought, your thought process and how do you price this? Yeah. And the market determines it, right? Yeah. Um, so you have your cost, I think your cost basis will help really determine your that and the market will determine what you sell it for ultimately. Right. Um, you know, we're, we feel we're a premium product, so we can hang on the higher end of the market, yeah. you know, to 249. Um, I don't see this product ever being 99 cents. It can't be with the ingredients no. in there. It's impossible. Yeah. That's where a lot of people, that's where like, as you scale a lot of, that's where a lot of, a lot of times you can go. But for us, given our cost basis, I don't think that's, ever feasible and we think about us like we won't it's not on our agenda to get there right. um, and we won't ever like cut quality or cut corners to get there so right. um right the quality is important yeah but it, you know um and then distribution wise was there a goal in mind like we want to get into whole foods we want to get into trader joe's early on yeah I mean, everyone wants, we all, everything, every consumer package, good company wants to work with those, you know, the top retailers. Um, and we weren't no different for us. Our early, like, this is something that I actually, when I talked to other entrepreneurs, that was really important for us is in the beginning, like when we were like ground zero, like starting the business, like we had one KPI, it was just like getting into gyms right. and it allowed us to focus on just servicing that. And we weren't distracted um, by like retail, like we were just like, we're going to go door to door and do this. Um, right. that was really valuable for us. Um, I remember asking, I remember like pulling our original cart and being like, can this even work in the grocery store? Like doubting it being like, oh, I don't care. Like it didn't uh, matter at the time. For you. Yeah. It didn't matter. And like, I remember just being grateful to have a business, right? Like I, I didn't, you know, and that's another expression I use is like, like when you get into business, like your job is to like, open your doors as wide as possible and make it very easy to do business with you and be open-minded and you're and listen to your customers and like follow those needs and be able to adapt to them. But most more like be very easy to do business with. Um, so, I mean, we've changed a lot. Like this is the product we had three years ago, the cost, the packaging just was different. For sure. You can see that. Yeah. yeah. If anyone's listening to the audio of this, they should check out the video and see the, the packaging uh, mm -hmm. evolution. What advice did you get from your family members? I mean, because there's advantages and disadvantages to going into Trader Joe's, right? What, what did they tell you? So my, father's was, my father was a pretty big mentor for Jared and I yeah. uh, early on. <clears throat> and I think the biggest, I don't think we would have the business today if it wasn't for this advice. Yeah. So like early on, like I was influenced by other like, entrepreneur, the scene, whatever. And I was like, oh, we need to like get an investor deck and go raise money to go to a manufacturer, to go to a design agency and hire all these people and orchestrate this business. Um, but Jared and I had no money, right? So we we're like, oh, we need to raise money. And it was like, my dad was like, listen, sell a I can't, I can't swear. Sorry. You can swear. So, That's fine. I'll just put explicit in iTunes. But yeah. Yeah. Sell, a sell a thousand dollars of the product and then think about like hiring a designer. And so it was very like, don't like, we didn't spend our time trying to like raise money. 
we spent our time just like selling product and making it, learning about it. And that was probably the most important thing. Like my natural reaction to starting the business was like, oh, I need like I need help. Like I need people and I need like resources. Um, but it, we were just like, you know what, that's actually my dad was like, you don't know, prove it, like sell it. And we just did that. Yeah. And we learned a lot in the process. Um, you know, that was the best advice we got today. And, you know, like we learned the craft. Like I was an outside where I was in the food business, but Jerry and I didn't know anything about bars. We had to learn the process, learn mm-hmm. how to formulate. We learned it all. And, um, today we know everything about the business and we didn't rely on anybody because if you pay somebody, they're not going to do as good of a job as you mm-hmm. do. Right. And that was like a very powerful lesson for us. And, um, so it's like mastery of your craft. You know, like I'm in the bar, I'm a bar, like I know everything about bars, like it's self-proclaimed, but like, <laughs> not, right. but that's like, that lesson was really powerful in the beginning because I wasn't just trying to orchestrate this business and I was actually just doing it and learning, putting each hat on and doing it. Yeah. So, so Peter, what all, what other great advice did your dad give you? Uh, don't care what other people think. What was he referring to at the time? Just like the noise, like. You know, like focus on like naysayers. You mean like saying why are you doing this? Yeah, like trust me. When I was telling people like, oh, the world didn't need another bar in 2013, right? Um, That that was really important. Just kind of like focus on what you want to do, and just like there's going to be negative people out there, and but yeah. And the other thing is like be patient. Uh, It's hard to do. Yeah, because like when you're a young kid, you want like you want to have a huge business, but it's like. We had very humble beginnings, like making product in our kitchen and selling it was not a glamorous thing. Like it wasn't, I mean, I was proud, but it wasn't something like, yeah, like I'm not going to get girls. It only sounds product. good like 10 years later when your business is huge. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> not at the time when you're actually making the bars, yeah. Like Jira and I were in hair nets and we used to shave <laughs> arms and like, because we didn't want hair in the product. Like that, like that was not fun and you have to be patient and so it's like patience and planning are very important um, in growing a business I w- it doesn't happen overnight I wish I had a picture of that do you guys take pictures of you in hair nets yeah we have like you two. do they're like my, my mother was like we have to get a picture and I was like no we don't need a picture and I'm so <laughs> grateful that she took that picture because like, that's the only thing we got <laughs> I love that well if yeah. you send it to me I'm going to put it on the post um, if you want it on the post, that I is. will. Okay, cool. Um, what should people watch out for uh, for distribution, like in Trader Joe's? Now that you've kind of navigated that a bit, um, like there's I mean, obviously advantages, but what are some of the things that people should think about as a disadvantage? I think the main thing is like view them as partners. Like they're an extension of you. Like when you think about the supply chain from like the farm to the retailer, like mm-hmm. your job as a brand is to, like make sure you take the product all the way and like the retailer is the end of the supply chain where you're giving it to the customer. And so I view it as like, I view like every relationship we have as partnership and it's the same thing on the, the front end of the, the supply chain. Um, and like have a mindset of like, how can I help them be successful and therefore help us be successful there? I think that's an important mindset. And instead of viewing them as like, Oh, like view them as a partner's not like, Oh, customer, how can I help you? Be like, how can we win? How can we win together? Yeah. How how did you get into Trader Joe's? Um, it's a good question. Um, I think the see like the natural the natural um, the net yeah the natural foods like circuit so like the trade shows and whatnot. Um, you can't I can't tell you all my secrets. <laughs> but I have to ask them. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean we have a great team and we're we're in a good we have a good pro- good product. Our team is in a great position. And, um, you know, we've been fortunate enough to work with them. Because, um... Is that vague enough? <laughs> what's that? Is that vague enough? Do you have to be a certain size, do you think, to work with them? Like, were you waiting purposefully to grow to a certain point to approach them? Or I mean, because obviously, if someone's going to go gym to gym CrossFit-wise, you're not going to let this just be a passive process. Like, I'm just going to wait for Trader Joe's to come to me. I mean, I could see someone like you, like, calling everyone at Trader Joe's and figuring out how to navigate that. So... From a thought process standpoint, what point did you want the business to be before you approached them? Yeah, that's a good question because you, the brand and your 
the organization has to be ready to handle a, an account like that. Yeah. Um, and that's like part of patience, right? Like you can't, we weren't, we would never been able to ready. We weren't ready a year ago to do it. So a lot of the, a lot of it's timing. Um, and another thing I, our team and I have learned is like you like that hustle, like calling and like banging on doors doesn't work with big accounts. Like they don't want, they're getting harassed all the time. Like right. it's not effective to like be a pest. Um, however, that's like your, it's like as an entrepreneur, that could be your nature. Like that right. could work for a one-off mom and pop. Right. But that style doesn't work for these national accounts. Where like at the end of the day, like they choose you, right? Like you have you have data on, on the product. Um, you just got to make sure you're in the best spot to do it. So Peter, what's your process for launching a new flavor? Do you have any on the like ready to go now or that you can talk about? I don't know if you can or not. Yeah. Like if, for people who don't know, you've got you know maple maple sea salt, chocolate sea salt, mint chocolate, blueberry, coconut chocolate, peanut butter, pumpkin spice, coffee, chocolate, apple cinnamon. What's what's on the pipeline, if you can say? Yeah. Well, first question: the process. We we have like we developed like five flavors at a time. You do like horse race, but yeah, like R and D is like. We're an R and D centric company, yeah. um, and so the way, my philosophy is like whatever best comes out of the, the kitchen or lab should go to market first. Like, how do you determine uh, best? You just taste, like sensory taste analysis. wise. Yeah, sensory analysis. So who's like the official taste testers? Like, we we all we all. T I mean, I have a pretty good palate, but we all. Sh I mean, we're making product every day, so we just share it. Um, get, get people, a lot of our customers too. So we'll send it out to like our friends, our community, get opinion. Um, at the same time, like, you know, when it's good, like, yeah, you probably have customer suggestions. Yeah. All the time. And we do surveys and stuff to get people's input. Um, but yeah, it's, it's fun. That's like the fun flavor innovation is the fun part. Um, and, um, so yeah. what's coming out now? I don't know if I can say you it, but say. what's say the it. biggest rejection? What's been the biggest dud? Like you thought, like you mentioned bacon, right? What else yeah. did you think was going to work and just, it was, didn't come out well at all. Bacon was for sure was the biggest failure. Um, pumpkin spice, the first round was just like, terrible. but you stuck with it. Yeah. So something it's about it. I mean, we're pursuing excellence. With it. <laughs> what else besides those um, was just, we made a cherry one that was tough. Yeah, it's um, tough. You know, the thing is, we don't sell crap. Like, if, if it doesn't taste good in the first version, the first round of R&D, like, we're not going to move forward. Um, God. Yeah, like, banana nut, banana bread, or, like, that. We did I could banana see that. One. Like, people like the idea of it. It sounds great, but, like, executing it with our product, not, it's not always it's easy. Not good, yeah. Uh, when will you do you launch a certain time period like after you know we're developing after six months or does it depend when the flavor uh, hits? Yeah, I say it takes about nine to twelve months to get it from like conception to market. Yeah. Um, yeah, and there's lots. When of will variety. the next one release? When will uh, the next version? January, February. Okay. That, I think February in that timeline, um, yeah. and I can't wait. So, so many questions. You got to come to our office. I'm going to come. Yeah. Yeah. So many questions. I know we only have three minutes. So, I'm going to ask, since it's inspired by Insider, I always ask, um, what's been the lowest point? And then, what's been the proudest moment? What's been the lowest point in the journey so far? Uh, Besides the hairnet. I'm a pretty positive person. Um, the low point would probably be my, my father had a heart attack. Well, So, it's like personal life issue overlapping with a very challenging professional issue. So my father had a heart attack and then professionally, um, we just had an issue with, um, with some product in the market that we had to do a voluntary, we just voluntarily recall like we, we wanted to buy back the product. So it was like those two issues overlapped at the same time. And in, this is early on, like really early on. It's uh, a big hit, especially when you're bootstrapping the company. Yeah, and you're not paying yourself shit. You know, like that's that happened. That was probably the lowest point. Yeah. Um, but that adversity is good. Like, my father's fine, so don't worry about that. Yeah. Um, and we learned that's a lot good. of lessons 
And Plus, he's a, not just a father, but he's your a mentor in the business too. Yeah, yeah. He's kind of like an earlier founder. Like he was really helpful in the beginning. Um, but yeah, so that was probably the darkest day. How did me. you survive not paying yourself? Like, what what were you doing? I mean, we did, but it was just like not much. In the beginning, it was like I could barely pay rent for the first three months. Um, but the good thing about our business, the way we grew it from like batch to sale, remember we didn't collect, we weren't building up an inventory, both on the raw material and the finished product. Mm -hmm. And so we were cash flow positive pretty quickly, um, especially for like, and I think the first six months we were profitable. Um, so, and after that we were able to like finally start paying ourselves a little bit. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to hear dad's okay. That's the most yeah. important. Thank you. What about the proudest moment so far? That's a good question. You know, every, to be honest, this is going to sound cheesy, but it's honest. Like when I walk into the office and I see everyone like working, working happy and like, it's like every day that makes that like makes me happy when I see our, our team happy. Um, and then that's like just ongoing, but I, I guess that if you're asking for a single moment, that's, that's really hard. What about a big sales day that you were like just pumped yeah. about? Yeah, that's what was that? Mondays are great, cause that's, but uh, I don't know. We, the thing we always wonder is like, you're, like they're talking about revenue. Like, there's no right answer. I feel like, you know what I mean? Like, what's the good? I feel like it's either too much or not enough, or, or like it doesn't. No one. There's no good outcome of it. But um, sales are great, and. When we when we get a new big key account, like those those moments we share them with the team are like definitely highs for sure. I, I mean I don't know if it was like was it for you? What was the most exciting place that you got into? I think Trader Joe's just because it's national like a national coverage and they're they're an amazing retailer. Um, Wegmans was another huge win for us. Um, they're they're like best in class for sure. Like yeah. Um, all of them, all the wins are amazing, um, and then that's the key thing is like to sell to like uh, to appreciate them and like be, just be grateful as you grow. Like not to be like humility is a really important value of ours, and as as we grow, like that's something that's very important. Um, and to remember the people early on that supported us is yeah. is key as we scale. Yeah, Peter, thank you. I can go on. I know you have a call right now. Everyone yeah. should go to rxbar.com. Check it out. Check out the design. Check out the product. Thank yeah. you. Fantastic. Appreciate it. Thank you for the time. <laughs>